Mm-hmm. Maria, do you remember um, when you first heard about the peace camp? Where you were? What? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, you and I were in a women's group together, and you told me about it and invited me to go out for a ritual, which I was interested in, so I went out, and the first two times I went out to the land, actually, it was after dark, and it was a phenomenal thing that happened. It was just a wonderful, first time I'd ever been in a group doing a ritual, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. It was after dark, there, had, there were cloths hung in the barn to make like a pathway to go in. We had candles all over and there was a copper bowl in the middle of the room that had candles in it. I know there was sage and I don't remember much more about it other than it was just very empowering. I enjoyed doing it a lot. And I remember it was so dark that I couldn't find the outhouse. And I had gone outside. And as I was doing my business, a car pulled in the driveway. And it was a police officer checking because one of the neighbors had seen lights on in the bar. Sure. And the third time I went out there during the day, all I could think of is, am I going to be able to find this in the daylight? <laughs> because the landmarks that I was using weren't there. There are lights at night. <laughs> Do you I remember, found it. Do you remember if there were very many women around at the time? Um, I there was at least eight women there. I can't. Other than you, I don't remember the names of anybody who was there. But um, I don't recall. Nobody was living there at the time, because that's why we had to use candles in the barn. Um, do you remember what year this was? Ninety-one. Nineteen ninety-one. Yeah, April of ninety-one. I wrote it on the outhouse wall <laughs> when I finally found it, so that I would remember what day I had, what when I had come out. Had you ever heard of the peace camp before no, that? Never heard of it before that. I just uh, was in my little life as I was trying to go along and um, trying to get my head straight, and the land helped me to get my head straight a lot. How so? It was a place where I could go and nobody had specific expectations of me, how I was supposed to behave, who I was supposed to be. Um, I was accepted for the person I presented myself as, and that was good. And I learned other ways of doing things, of being in the world. Um, I, that's where I started to get a real connection to the land out there, not just the peace land itself. And uh, when I originally wanted to move out there, I uh, wanted to live in open Amazon acres. And as my physical disabilities have happened, I kind of moved the house forward to the front of the land. <laughs> it's right up at the road right now. <laughs> what made you keep wanting to come? Um, the connection with the people, the women that came out there, because I didn't really have that. My mother died when I was 17, so I just really didn't have the, well, I had my grandmother, but I didn't really have a sense of the feminine nurturing you get from a mother, and that's kind of what connected me, is that's what I was getting from there, was it was a mother place to be, and I liked that. <laughs> And I wanted to be out there, and I wanted to meet these women from all over the country that I'd probably never be able to go to to begin with. Like Vermont, Florida, all the different places. And I'm so, we had some young ladies from Switzerland, just all the different people. And I think that was the best part, was you know getting to know people out there. So Maria, what were some of the things that you got involved in out there? Oh, let's see. Well, I did get involved in several political actions. I learned to not take such a straightforward physical approach to situations. The helicopter, we had a helicopter come around and buzz the, buzz the land for several hours. And I had this big black van that had a window that could come out 
over the seas. And I was all ready to go charge the helicopter if it landed. And I was told, no, you can't charge it, just follow it. That's not how we do things here. So we followed the helicopter and someone made a phone call to the local police who calls the army depot because it was a black helicopter, no markings, the guys had black uniforms on. And they got a call back and the army depot had no idea who these people were and they gassed up the helicopter at the depot. Uh, finally we get this call back and it's like, okay, let's make sure we have the same incident. Did a big black van chase the helicopter? Uh, yeah, it turns out that it was a narcotics force looking for the one pot plant that had been found the year before on the land. Um, there were, We had another um, action where the depot signs said committed to quality. So a bunch of us went up and made like we were tourists and um, took some pictures while somebody measured the letters. <laughs> we went back to the land and made an E on a piece of white, white um, contact paper and went back and stuck it on the sign It took more pictures. Now it said committed to equality. And, but just uh, sitting around and listening to all the stories from the different women um, kind of makes me wish I was involved earlier. But I was, I guess I wasn't ready to find the land at that point. And now I'm trying to get it back so that we can continue going. <laughs> yeah. Before we get there, yes. what was your understanding in 91 when you were out there of what was happening at that land or who was involved there? Or I'm not really sure to tell you the truth. Um, I knew that Estelle was involved in it. I knew there were a lot of women that had been through the land, um, that it had been purchased to protest nuclear weapons. And just as the years went on, learning of the different things that happened to the women there, and that was apparently still happening. Um, I don't believe I've ever experienced the zapping, or if I have, I'm just so insensitive and never penetrated. I've got a thick skull, what can I say? <laughs> but um, a lot of just different things that um, women would just come from so, from so many places and talk about so many different things. And that was more my connection to it than it being a protest against anything. Because at that point I think it was more dying down as far as being a protest and starting to do the transformation into a place where women could go to learn, which is more what my connection with it was. And was it Peaceland by the time you were involved or did it later? No, it wasn't Peaceland then, but it was mm -hmm. evolving into that. And did you at some point become a part of Peaceland? Oh yeah. Tell us yeah. about how that happened for you. Um, well, I guess I had been involved, I'm not really sure if it was that summer or the summer after that that I asked to be put on as a member and uh, was voted on and everybody agreed that I could be a part of the collective. Of the collective. And, um, I was doing a lot of stuff out there that I enjoyed doing to begin with that I can't do normally. And, oh, fixing the outhouse roof, climbing ladders, hauling gravel, chopping wood, <laughs> falling through the boardwalk. <laughs> it seemed like every time I went out there, for some reason or another, I always bled. No matter what, I always managed to hurt myself somewhere. <laughs> I'll leave my mark on the land. <laughs> well, I was able to do a lot of physical stuff that in my normal life I don't. There's no reason for it. I live in the city. What am I supposed to, you know, you don't really chop wood and haul gravel for that type of stuff. Um, I remember digging the, helping to dig the ditch to go to, from the house to the shower house. 
because we were putting a shower in that one year outside and uh, coming across a layer of uh, water washed rock that showed that that was lake area at one point and pulling out a bunch of little smooth rocks and uh, wiring them up so that the women could wear them the women that had come to help that to do that could wear them as pendants I still have a few of those um, chopping through the tree trunk and cutting down the cedar tree that started to fall you know, this is all stuff that normally I don't do because, as I said, I don't have access to it. But it is, it's a, it's a very empowering experience to go out there and use a chainsaw. <laughs> but um, trying to get the, uh, the right on tractor to work, same thing. I, you know, really read the manual and see if we can get it to run. Um, I learned uh, that I can do a lot more than I thought just by being out there. I mean, I already knew I could work on cars, I just didn't know the extent of that, where that knowledge would take me. <laughs> um, in a way, it was just affirming the fact that I was there, I was, um, I had, I don't want to say the right to be there, but, um, it was alright with everybody else that I was there type of thing. And not like so I was just somebody that came in off of the street and decided that this is where I wanted to be. Um, it was uh, kind of a welcome to the family. You know, here's your hat, find a hook for it. <laughs> Which I think I did pretty good. And how many members of Peace Land were there when you became involved? Mm. I'm not 100% sure back then. I do know that we had a meeting one year that I think we had better than 20 people show up. And that was, for that, at that time, that was a lot of people. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly how I started to take over the cooking chores. Um, I do know that, you know, physically um, I was declining. I couldn't do a lot of the stuff that I was able to, that everybody else could do, like climbing up on the roofs and that. And I was, I guess I was just trying to figure what can I do that would make it easier, you know, to help. And I just started cooking. And um, I didn't think I was doing any big deal of a thing. And then I was told, oh no, you're doing something very good because if it wasn't for you cooking, we would have to stop. Someone would have to stop doing what they're doing, get cleaned up, do the cooking, clean up afterwards, and you know, it takes several hours out of work time. So with me doing it, um, because you know, I wasn't really contributing otherwise, or I didn't think I was, um, it helped everybody out a lot. And just as the years went on, I got to know like um, Elliot, wasn't supposed to have, uh, I think Elliot was sugar and Grace was corn. <laughs> I found corn free ketchup. Um, I did vegan cooking for women because we had a lot of vegans that came out or vegetarians and it's just as easy to cook vegan as it is vegetarian. Um, I tried to make sure that there was food for everybody, basically. And people appreciated that. And I liked cooking. <laughs> when you say you guys were out there, how often? Was there a schedule of when people were, came to the land? Were there people living on the land? How, what um, did that look like? There wasn't anyone living there when I first started out. Um, there was, at one point, Estelle, Merry Christmas, Anne, Lisa. I'm trying to remember if there was somebody else that was staying there at one point. I guess it kind of varied, but the main group at that point was the Stalin and Merry Christmas. And they were living there, they had a fantastic garden going, and the only definite weekend that um, people would come for would be Fourth of July, because that was the meeting weekend every year. That was the, the weekend that people were expected to be there. In fact, the one Fourth of July that I kind of couldn't come, I got a phone call saying, you're supposed to be here, so I went. <laughs> I went out anyways. 
Um, but most of the time it was just kind of catch as catch can. You know, go out there. Um, I tried to be out there at least one weekend a month. And I got my roommate Marianne involved and she liked cleaning. So she would come out, she would do the cleaning. <laughs> Make sure the place stayed, you know, fairly neat for when people, for when women would stop, do vacuuming and stuff, and um, make sure that like food hadn't been left from the previous weekend that somebody was there, and um, any foodstuffs that were left were taken care of properly, stuff along that line. Tell yeah. us about painting the pit. Oh, um, we had kind of decided. I actually. What had happened was the desk corner, where all the paperwork and everything was, I was just decided to straighten it up, put up a couple of shelves, and it kind of took me over and I ended up painting it. Well, Estelle and I decided that one weekend when Anne wasn't there, because Anne hated a mess, um, that we would do the rest of the pit. This is the way I remember it. So she left, and she wasn't supposed to be home till 4.30, so we had gotten everything pulled out and we painted everything because the old lady purple that was in the pit was kind of a depressing color to tell you the truth. Um, but we had gotten everything painted and we were just getting ready to put everything back and Anne walks in. And well, what do you think? And she looked around and went, it's bright. <laughs> And it's like, well, if you had come home when you said it would have been taken, we would have finished taking care of the rest of it. But it kept painted white, um, and it looked much better. It was bright. It was brighter, and you know, it didn't feel quite so closed in. But yeah, and I ended up. I was able to bring some furniture out periodically. So we had a couch that devoured people. <laughs> you'd lay on it and it would just kind of enfold you and you'd go to sleep and it's alright, now how do I get out of it when you get up in the morning? It's very comfortable for sleeping at, at least it was for me. <laughs> yes, uh, June Sun started um, a walk from the land and I did the support car um, I did support car and actually the Barbara Demi and the June Sun walks uh, you'd go up a mile and then you would wait for the people and I did that up into Waterloo and somebody else took off and she sent me a nice postcard. I still have it. I don't have it with me, but I have the postcard that she sent saying thank you for all the help. And she left us some um, cranes that were hanging in the pit. What, what kept you coming back? Um, it was a good place to be. It um, made me feel good to be there. Just going out there and, you know, as soon as I'd get in sight of the house, it would be a good feeling. Um, I, I felt energized when I went out there. I felt a connection. I didn't have to sleep with earplugs in. There were a lot of things about disability that you had to deal with. Yeah, I'm still dealing with, but yeah. Um, the fact that I can't move around like I used to, and I can't do what I want to do. I mean, stuff that I was able to do even four years ago now, I can't do because of injuries and loss of the muscle toning and everything. But um, I really want to be out at the land because in a way, I'm forced to do more because it is a harder life to be out there. I mean, just going to the bathroom. <laughs> it's a 30-foot walk from the house. Come on now. <laughs> Granted, I don't have to do any steps, but that still, that little bit extra helps. I, the good thing was that I could take my vehicle on the road as long as it wasn't wet. I could take it to the back. I could be out there. Um, the meditation circle, just being able to sit and be by myself and listen to myself and listen to everything around me. It was a good spot. It was a good place to be. Showering with a hummingbird. 
we set up a hose down out in the meditation circle. And I don't still see well with my glasses off, but I saw that hummingbird in the water with me. I looked up and it's like, oh, and she's right there. And it's like, I'm not breathing because I don't want to scare her. And she gets on the branch and she shakes all the water off and she comes back in the water again. And it was just like, wow. Or sitting in the meditation circle and listening to, listening to the cicadas hit the trees. <laughs> cicadas are clumsy. And you just hear, zzz, zzz, zzz. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it was just, it was good. It was an empowering place for me. It was a connection, connected place for me. I really wanted to stay there. And... Did you ever have bad experiences there? Um, just one that I can remember, and that was an after-the-fact experience. Um, I had laid down for a nap thinking that there were going to be people around, and got up still thinking that were, there was people around, and went out of the house, and you pulled into the yard, and until that point in time, I didn't realize that I was alone. And that was within the first couple of years of being there. And for some reason, once I realized that I had been out there alone, I was terrified. And I started crying. I had no idea what that was all about. I guess it's just one of those, you know, it's a, a city-conditioned response. Hmm. And, uh, you know, with the hunting out there and everything else, I wasn't at that point sure how safe I was. But before that, and ever since then, I, did, I hadn't had any bad experiences out there that I can remember. <laughs> I tried not to remember bad stuff, so. But that one made an impression on me. Long term, um, I, want, I wanted to be living out there. I wanted to help transform it into a place where women could go to learn to learn how to be themselves in a safe environment. Um, a place where traveling women could stop and just visit and have a place where they could just <sighs> for a day or two before they had to go on to the next route of where they were going. Um, I wanted to have my friend Marianne living there too because she feels a lot of the same ways about living out there. It's a good place. It's a hard place because of, you know, no sewer system and electricity, you know. But um, that could be worked around. We used to go, I used to go at dawn over to the Samson State Park and fill up water jugs uh, when we didn't have water at one point so that we would have water on the land. I can't drink the water from the land itself. Uh, it's a high sodium content and I swell. But, um, you know, that wasn't really that big of an issue. They, you know, I dealt with it. But I want to I be there. Uh, I even found uh, the summer before all of this mess with the taxes came down, I even found um, 12 by 20 foot buildings from Sauters that they would deliver. Our, the land is 11 miles from Sauters. Within 20 miles they deliver free. And for $3,300 we could have cabins. I mean, that's delivered in taxes and all. <laughs> we would just have to put down some kind of flooring and finish them off, and we've got cabins. I still called and said we lost the land. I was like, what? And my understanding is that every piece of paper involving the land, taxes and legal-wise, got to Estelle, who had to deal with that, except the one piece of paper stating they were changing the date on the for the taxes to be paid because they didn't put the apartment number on it. Because that one piece of paper didn't get there, we lost the land for a little over $8,000 in taxes. I'm still going through it. I mean, it's still a total depression thing for me. Um, the land, even if I didn't get out there as often as I wanted to, as long as I knew it was there, and I knew it was, there was some place that I could go to get away from the life I have to live right now. Um, you know, it was a good spot for me. It was a place that I could go to, even just in my head. But having that not be able to even go out there anymore, 
just um, devastated. It hurts inside really bad. I want to be able to go out there, and I can't now. I haven't been out there. Um, the, the last time I went out there, um, the man had already started doing renovations. He knocked over the tool shed. Um, he cut down the elderberry. He plowed under the peace garden, the rock garden in the front. The bus was gone. Um, so I don't. I haven't been out there since. I haven't been able to. My car broke down, and that was that. So I don't know what he's done since then. Maria, before we lost the land, there were a number of things that we had done uh, to try to generate more interest, to raise money. Do you remember any of those? Oh, the barter event? Yeah, yeah we had a barter event. Um, I kind of took that, off, took that on. We ended up with 13 people showing up. Um, more people than I thought, but we tried to um, get some income that way. Um, we did several mailings. Um, word of mouth talking to people. I actually got some of my online friends in involved in it. Um, one of the women sent us some money, but we ended up sending it back because we lost the land. But. Um, a lot of it was a word of mouth and the bar event, and I'm well trying to blank with maybe with other things. I know that. Do you remember uh, the uh, the conference that was held on the land? Yeah, yeah. Um, the writers conference. Yeah, because I was asked to not join the groups <laughs> because I had no idea what was going on. Which was, you know, at the time it was like. I didn't feel good about it, but now it's like, okay, well, I didn't know what was going on, so I really had no business. But I helped out with that. I did cooking and um, went and picked cherries from our cherry trees. Brought a big basket of cherries up so that they had organic cherries. <laughs> well, nothing's ever been done to that cherry tree, so. But yeah, we had that happen. Um, not sure what else happened. Well, we tried, I know we tried to sell some of the posters and that. Um, what was your understanding of how much taxes were a year and how they got paid? My understanding was they were approximately 3000 a year and it was paid through donations or whatever the women could come up with. And we were um, two years behind. If we didn't get the third year paid, then we lost the land and that third year didn't get paid. And um, several people have said, well, if they had known, the tax, it's like the taxes are due every year. They're due the same time every year. And you knew what we, that they were due. Why didn't you contact Estelle or Merry Christmas and find out what's going on? It's a, we had uh, the 15 year anniversary. The fire, the fire still died. burns. The fire still burns. Yeah, I did some artwork for that. Um, and we had invited a lot of people mm -hmm. and we offered memberships and mm -hmm. we did and get a couple of donations yeah. at that time. But pretty much taxes were paid out of pocket. Yeah. Um, I paid the whole thing one year yeah. and paid one year. Yeah, you Grace guys did. paid one year. Grace yeah. paid one year. Yeah. All right. We scraped by for the last five we, years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We've been scraping by for the last 15 years. No. Well, yeah. <laughs> it had been behind, as far as I know, for many years. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just um, always the way it was. We never had enough money. Yeah, I kind of wish that um, I had just moved out there three years ago because then my income would have been available, but there was things that had to be done first that I, wasn't, I just couldn't move out there at that point. Yeah. What are your plans now? Well, right now I'm in a holding pattern. Um, I want to get the land back. If, I get, if we get the land back, fine, great. We'll work from there. If we don't get the land back, I still have to go on. Um, 
I'm keep, I want to keep contact with the women involved. I've made a lot of close friendships through there. I've met a lot of interesting people. Um, I need to get my nose out of my computer games and back into the real world. <laughs> That's what I got to do. So I haven't done any of my craft work for a year and a half. Does Women's Peace Land still exist, even though the land doesn't? It's not it always will. As long as there's women that remember it, it always will. And as long as there's women that remember it that are telling other people about it, it always will. It's less the land now and more of the feeling inside. The peace and connection to other people, other women, that's important. I mean, the land was great, it was there, it may be gone. I'm very upset over that, but the women are there. The women are still around. Do you have any feelings about having, that we failed at what we did? No, we didn't fail at what we did. It may not have been the right time for it, that's all. Um, if it's supposed to happen, it will happen. If it doesn't happen, then it wasn't supposed to happen. Why did we end up with poor women at the land, do you suppose? Because those are the ones that needed it the most. When you have the wealth to support the life that you're accustomed to, the life that you are coming from. Um, in a way that you don't need a place like the land. But when you don't have enough, you need the outside help even if it's just moral support. And that's what the land was. A lot of it was for me, it was the moral support. The fact that I'm a person who is worth something. And, you know, not having it there now is hard. So I want it there, I want that support system there. And the, the, the land made a convenient touchstone for everybody to come to. And when you've only got a couple, maybe a dozen or so women involved a couple times a year, that really wasn't enough time for the resources to be there for the land to stay operative. If we'd had people living there all along, I think that would have been different because there would have been someone there all the time, someone there to um, take care of the, well, the wood room being empty, the electricity needing to be paid, the mail picked up, that type of thing, the daily go to, you know, the daily things that need to be done, but the daily things weren't done. They would be done once or twice a year, and it needs to be more often than that for that type of situation. Yeah. Once there wasn't anyone living there, there wasn't anybody keeping it up, there wasn't a constant presence there because, well, women would stop, and there's nobody there, so, oh, and then the, the media got out that uh, the women's land was closed, and that stopped a lot of women from coming. Oh, if it's closed, we're not, you know, why bother stopping? But if, you know, as long as there was a continuing presence on the land at this, there was somebody there, there was that whole, that steady trickle coming into the land. Uh -huh. But once there wasn't anybody there, that trickle, you know, disappeared. It may have been just a bit, uh, been a trickle, but it was enough to keep us going. <laughs> uh -huh. Maria, had you been a craftswoman before you started coming out to the camp? Oh, yeah. It kind of turned it in a different direction. Tell us about that. <laughs> Um, I got more into clay work, um, more imaginative, met women who brought their own unique skills to the land so I had more examples to work with. Um, 
I made clay women. Um, I can even remember the weekend that we were there. Um, it was a meeting weekend. And for some reason I happened to have some clay and marbles with me and I had been reading The Mammoth Hunters. And they have pictures in the front of the book. And I was looking at this and the connection with the land somehow, I just started making these little clay women out of poly, is the poly, clay, uh, sculpy clay. Mm -hmm. And they came out phenomenal, and I've been making them ever since. And I wasn't doing that before that, I was doing flowers. <laughs> and little, you know, odd things, I wasn't really using my imagination. But connecting into that, and I, um, out in the meditation circle, if you look close at the trees, there's bugs, beaded bugs on some of the trees out there that I just I had been making and I stuck them in the trees. <laughs> but yeah, it, um, I started doing more um, weeding things, um, the croning staffs, I helped with the croning staffs, I did the crowns for the croning ceremony. Um, well actually I showed some of the women how to do those. Um, teaching other people how to do some of the things that I do. And, you know, just getting a lot of different ideas from out there and being out there. Right. Maria, you were known as, if somebody didn't, how can we make this work? Go ask Maria, she'll figure <laughs> something out. See, I didn't know that. Uh -huh. I didn't know that. That's good. Often that happens. That makes yeah. me feel good. Yeah. Oh, they, it was a feeling of belonging, of being included. Um, everybody got to poke at the fire, you got to talk, you got to sing. Did you have a favorite song? Not really. I just loved listening to everybody. A lot of the songs I don't know, I didn't know. Actually, yes, I have a favorite song, <laughs> and I don't ask me to sing it because I can't oh, remember please. any of the words to it, but Real it's the thing. one about you. And the oh. bolt cutters. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> hey, Maria, um, what about, um, I sat under a green oak tree. A tall oak tree, yeah. A tall oak tree. Yeah. Sing, I, sing that one. I sat under a tall oak tree, asked the goddess to shelter me. She wrapped me up in ancient green, ancient green, all my tears. All my tears, all my tears. River's gonna wash them away. River's gonna wash them away. I made up more verses to that too. Do you remember any? Not really, because I haven't sung it in so long. I wrote it down, but I haven't sung it in uh -huh. so long. Do you miss that? Yeah, I really okay. like singing. Um, I remember one night it was so hot and we were just trying to see each other so I was sitting there with twigs and just tossing a twig on every once in a while just to get enough flame for us to see each other <laughs> without making the fire too hot. On the stars and the fireflies and Merry Christmas and the fireworks. <laughs> you remember that year? <laughs> Tell us. Oh, she'd gotten some fireworks and she was setting them off in the driveway. And you know the ones that you put on a stick and then they spin? She didn't put them on a stick. <laughs> She's put them in the driveway and chasing up. people. <laughs> were those meetings hard for you? Some of them were. Um, some of them I just didn't understand what was being talked about. Some of them dealt with issues that I guess I'm more accepting of and some people weren't ready to deal with at that point in time, weren't grown up enough. I mean, you know, that's all I can think of. Um, once I started talking up, feeling comfortable enough to talk up, and speak up and let my opinions be known, that made a difference too. Because I remember for a long time I just kind of sat and listened. And you kind of, you don't have to just listen, you can talk too, you know. <laughs> Maria, another thing I remember about you was that you kept the the date journal 
Do you remember that? That you were the reminder for everybody? Um, Before we started working with the computer, when we started yeah. working with the computer, then we would like, well, yeah. those meetings were, remember we, by the end of the meeting, we'd have a two hour meeting, everybody would have a sheet of what their responsibilities. Yes. yes. And that was phenomenal. We were really cooking with gas then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember, those few years. Well, I remember also the best meetings we ever had were the non-meetings. <laughs> <laughs> We wouldn't really um, have a meeting scheduled or like it would be for the next day or whatever. And we would just start talking about stuff and, oh, okay, let me write that down and, well, we should do this. And then we would just start talking and all of a sudden we would realize, wait a minute, we've just had our meeting that we're supposed to have tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so mostly your experience was quite favorable. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Mm. I don't. Well, the um, the couple of times that I had issues, we were able to discuss them, which was really good, and we got it resolved, and no problems after that. So that's one. Of, that's one of the reasons that I'm able to have um, the friendship that I do with Marianne, with having her living in my household. Um, because it's like, listen, there's an issue and we need to talk about it. And I know you don't want to hear about it, but we need to talk about it. <laughs> Was that a familiar experience to be able to do that? Before the land, no. Um, after the land, yes. Because <laughs> there's a lot of issues <laughs> that need to be talked about that people don't want to talk about. And I found that works really well. Another one is I have a problem and I don't know if you're the person to help me, but I'm hoping either you can or you can tell me somebody who can help me. That works really well too. Especially with things like government issue agencies. <laughs> but yeah, I learned a lot out there. You know, I want to keep learning. Learned a lot about abuse. Uh, yeah. Well, I knew about abuse. I learned a lot about how to deal with it in a different and more effective manner. So, that helped a lot too. How did the camp help with that? I am a survivor of abuse from my father. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, sexual, the whole nine yards. Um, I didn't become an abuser myself. I would never do that to anybody. But being out there and talking to women of similar experiences and what they've done and allowing their experiences to influence my life, learning from their examples. There are lessons that everyone has to learn for themselves. But in certain instances, you can learn from other people's happenings. As long as you allow that to come into your life and make it part of the way you are, how you deal with things. And that being out there taught me a lot of that. I can't give you specifics, but just being out there with the women who have been through the same thing and going through what they're going through. I'm able to learn um, from those people and be able to put it to my own life and not become an abuser and learn different ways of dealing with situations. Like, like no, we can't charge the helicopter. <laughs> Just that I keep praying that we get it back because I really want to, in a way, any other piece of land would do, but in a way it has to be that piece of land because that's what everybody knows. That's where all of the women from the past 20 years knows. And I want to be there when someone who 10 years ago comes to the land and says, oh yes, it's still here. <laughs> I want to be there when that happens. I don't want to have this man that bought the land open the door and go, they're not here anymore, leave me alone. <laughs> Do you have a sense of how to get the land back? Um, I keep buying lottery tickets. So buy it.